Chapter 13, Medieval Aspects and Occasions. We therefore turn to later writers in the Aristotelian tradition with a set of already formulated questions. But before we pose these questions to certain medieval writers, it is important to make two initial remarks. The first is to underline the fact that the tradition of thinking about the virtues which I'm trying to delineate is not to be confused with the narrower tradition of Aristotelianism, which consists simply in commentary upon and exegesis of Aristotle's texts. When I first spoke of the tradition with which I am concerned in chapter 5, I used the equally misleading expression classical morality, equally misleading since classical is too wide, just as Aristotelian is too narrow. But although the tradition is not easy to name, it is not too difficult to recognize. After Aristotle, it always uses the Nicomachean ethics and the politics as key texts when it can, but it never surrenders itself wholly to Aristotle, for it is a tradition which always sets itself in a relationship of dialogue with Aristotle rather than in any relationship of simple assent. When 18 or 1900 years after Aristotle, the modern world came systematically to repudiate the classical view of human nature, and with it, in the end, a great deal that had been central to morality, it did repudiate it very precisely as Aristotelianism. That buffoon who has misled the church, said Luther of Aristotle, setting the tone, and when Hobbes ex explained the Reformation, he saw it as partially due to the failing of virtu in the pastors, but partially from, from bringing of the philosophy and the doctrine of Aristotle into religion, Leviathan 1.12. In fact, of course, and this is the second initial remark that needs to be made, the medieval world encountered Aristotle relatively late and even Aquinas encountered him only in translation, and when it did encounter him, what he provided was at best a partial solution to a medieval problem which had already been stated time and time again. That problem was how to educate and civilize human nature in a culture in which human life was in danger of being torn apart by the conflict of too many ideals, too many ways of life. All of the mythological ways of thinking which have disguised the Middle Ages for us, of all the mythological ways of thinking which have disguised the Middle Ages for us, none is more misleading than that which portrays a unified and monolithic Christian culture, and this not just because the medieval achievement was also Jewish and Islamic. Medieval culture, insofar as it was a unity at all, was a fragile and complex balance of a variety of disparate and conflicting elements. To understand the place of the theory and practice of the virtues within it, it is necessary to recognize a number of different and conflicting strands in medieval culture, each of which imposed its own strains and tensions on the whole. The first is that which derives from the fact that in a multiplicity of ways medieval society had only just made its own transition out of what I earlier called heroic society. Germans, Anglo-Saxons, Norwegians, Icelanders, Irishmen, and Welshmen all had a pre-Christian past to remember, and many of their social forms and much of their poetry and story embodied those pasts. Often both forms and stories were Christianized so that the pagan warrior king could emerge as the Christian knight, remarkably unchanged. Often Christian and pagan elements coexisted in varying degrees of compromise and tension, much as Homeric values coexisted with those of the city-state in the 5th century. In one part of Europe, it was the Icelandic sagas which came to play much the same role as that of the Homeric poems. In another, it was the Tain Bo Kulinj and the tales of the Finna. In a third, the already Christianized Arthurian saga, or sorry, the already Christianized Arthurian cycle. So the memory of heroic society is present in the tradition which I am identifying twice over. Once as the background to 5th and 4th century Athenian society, and once again in the background to the High Middle Ages. It is this double presence 
which makes the moral standpoint of heroic society a necessary starting point for the moral for reflection within the tradition with which we are concerned. So the medieval order cannot reject the heroic table of the virtues. Loyalty to family and to friends, the courage required to sustain the household or a military expedition, and a piety which accepts the moral limits and impositions of the cosmic order are central virtues, partially defined in terms of institutions such as the code of revenge in the sagas. In the early medieval Germanic law, for example, murder is a crime only when it is the secret killing of an unidentified person. When a known person kills another known person, not the criminal law, but revenge by a kinsman is regarded as the appropriate response. And this distinction between two classes of killing seems to survive in England as late as the reign of Edward I. Nor is this merely a point about law as contrasted with morals. The moralization of medieval society lies precisely in creating general categories of right and wrong and general modes of understanding right and wrong and out of them a code of law, which could replace the particular bonds and fractures of an older paganism. Viewed retrospectively, trial by ordeal seems to many modern writers superstitious, but when trial by ordeal was first introduced, its function too was precisely to place in a public and cosmic context in a quite new way the wrongs of private and local life. When, therefore, in the 12th century, the question of the relationship of pagan to Christian virtues is explicitly posed by theologians and philosophers, it is much more than a theoretical question. It was indeed the rediscovery of classical texts and of, and of a strange assortment of classical texts, Macrobius, Cicero, Virgil, which first occasioned the theoretical problem. But the paganism with which scholars such as John of Salisbury and Peter Abelard or William of Cones wrestled was partially within themselves in their own society, even if in a form quite other than that of the ancient world. Moreover, the solutions which they propounded had to be translated into a curriculum not only for the schools of cathedral chapters or of regular canons, but also in turn for universities. Some of them even became the schoolmasters of the powerful, Thomas Becket studied in Paris while Abelard was teaching, and William of Conches was the tutor of England's Henry II. It may have been William of Conches who wrote the Moralium Dogma Philosophorum, a textbook which owed most to Cicero's De Officis, but, he, but a great deal to other classical writers. This acceptance of the classical tradition, even in so partially and fragmentarily recovered a form, was a course completely at variance with one type of Christian teaching, influential to varying degrees throughout the Middle Ages, which dismissed all pagan teaching as the devil's work and sought to find in the Bible an all-sufficient guide. Luther, indeed, was the heir of this medieval tradition, but its negative dismissals left the problem of the shape of a Christian life in the 12th century world or in any other specific social world insoluble. That problem is one of translating the Bible's message into a particular and detailed set of discriminations among contemporary alternatives, and for that task, one needs types of concepts and types of inquiry not, of, not made available by the Bible itself. There are, of course, times and places when what the contemporary secular world offers merits only complete rejection, the kind of rejection with which Jewish and Christian communities under, their, under the Roman Empire had to confront the demand that they worship the emperor. These are the moments of martyrdom. But for long periods of Christian history, this total either or is not the choice with which the world confronts the church. It is not how to die as a martyr, but how to relate to the forms of daily life that the Christian has to learn. For the writers of the 12th century, this question is posed in terms of the virtues. How is the practice of the four cardinal virtues of justice, prudence, temperance, and courage to be related to that of the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity? As early as 1300, this classification of the virtues is found in vernacular as well as in Latin writers. In Abelard's Ethics, written about 1138, 
The key distinction which is put to the service of answering this question is that between a vice and a sin. What Abelard took to be Aristotle's definition of a virtue, transmitted to him by Boethius, is put to use to provide a corresponding definition of a vice. Elsewhere, in Abelard's dialogue between a philosopher, a Jew, and a Christian, the philosopher, who is the voice of the ancient world, lists and defines the cardinal virtues in Cicero's, not Aristotle's, terms. Abelard's accusation against the philosopher is not only or even principally one of positive error. What he stresses are the errors of omission in the pagan moral view, the incompleteness of the pagan account of the virtues, even in its best representatives. This incompleteness is ascribed to the inadequacy both of the philosopher's conception of the supreme good and of the philosopher's beliefs about the relationship of the human will to good and evil. But it is the latter that Abelard which is to wishes to stress. What Christianity requires is a conception not merely of defects of character or vices, but of breaches of divine law, of sins. An individual's character may at any given time be a compound of virtues and vices, and these dispositions will preempt the will to move in one direction or another but it is always open to the will to assent or dissent from these promptings. Even the possession of a vice does not necessitate the performance of any particular wrong action. Everything turns on the character of the interior act of the will. Character, therefore, the arena of the virtues and vices, simply becomes one more circumstance external to the will. The true arena of morality is that of the will and of the will alone. This interiorization of the moral life, with its stress on will and law, looks back not only to certain New Testament texts, but also to Stoicism. It is worth considering its Stoic ancestry in order to bring out the tension between any morality of the virtues and a certain type of morality of law. On the Stoic view, unlike the Aristotelian, Arete is essentially a singular expression at its possession by an individual an all or nothing matter. Either someone possesses that perfection which arete, virtus, and bonitas are both used as Latin translations, requires, or he does not. With virtue, one has moral worth. Without it, one is morally worthless. There are no intermediate degrees. Since virtue requires right judgment, the good man is, on the Stoic view, also the wise man, but he is not necessarily successful or effective in his actions. To do what is right need only necessarily produce pleasure or happiness, bodily health or worldly, or indeed any other success. None of these, however, are genuine goods. They are goods only conditionally upon their ministering to right action by an agent with a rightly formed will. Only such a will is unconditionally good. Hence, Stoicism abandoned any notion of a telos. The standard to which a rightly acting will must conform is that of the law, which is embodied in nature itself, of the cosmic order. Virtue is thus conformity to cosmic law, both in internal disposition and in external act. That law is one and the same for all rational beings. It has nothing to do with local particularity or, ex or circumstance. The good man is a citizen of the universe. His relation to all other collectives, to city, kingdom, or empire, is secondary and accidental. Stoicism thus invites us to stand against the world of physical and political circumstance at the very same time that it requires us to act in conformity with nature. There are symptoms of paradox here, and they are not misleading. For, on the one hand, virtue finds purpose and point outside itself. To live well is to live the divine life. To live well is to serve not one's private purposes, but the cosmic order. Yet in each individual case, to do what is right is to act without any eye to my further purpose at all. It is simply to do whatever is right for its own sake. The plurality of the virtues and their teleological ordering in the good life, as both Plato and Aristotle beyond them, Sophocles and Homer, as both Plato and Aristotle and beyond them, Sophocles and Homer, had understood them, disappear. 
a simple monism, that is to say, it's a view of unity, of virtue, takes its place. It is unsurprising that the Stoics and Aristotle's later followers were never able to live in argumentative peace with each other. Stoicism is not, of course, only an episode in Greek and Roman culture. It sets a pattern for all those later European moralities that invoke the notion of law as central in such a way as to displace conceptions of the virtues. This is a type of opposition which, given my discussion in the previous chapter of the relationship between that part of morality which consists in the negative prohibiting rules of the law and that part which concerns the positive goods towards which virtue moves us, ought to appear surprising, although subsequent moral history has made us so familiar with it that we are in fact unlikely to be surprised. In discussing Aristotle's brief remarks on natural justice, I suggested that a community which envisages its life as directed toward a shared good, which provides that community with its common tasks, will need to articulate its moral life in terms both of the virtues and of law. This suggestion is perhaps a clue to what happened in Stoicism. For given the disappearance of such a form of community, just such a disappearance as was, as was involved in the replacement of the city-state as the form of political life by first the Macedonian kingdom and later the Roman imperium, any intelligible relationship between the virtues and law would disappear. There would be no genuine shared common good. The only goods would be the goods of individuals, and the pursuit of any private good being often and necessarily in these circumstances liable to clash with the good of others would appear to be at odds with the requirements of the moral law. Hence, if I adhere to the law, I will have to suppress the private self. The point of the law cannot be the achievement of some good beyond the law, for there now appears to be no such good. If I am right, then, Stoicism is a response to one particular type of social and moral development, a type of development which strikingly anticipates some aspects of modernity. Hence, we should expect, and we do in fact find, recurrences of Stoicism. Indeed, whenever the virtues begin to lose their central place, Stoic patterns of thought and action at once appear. Stoicism remains one of the permanent moral possibilities within the cultures of the West. That it did not provide the only or even the most important model for those moralists who later would make the concept of a moral law into the whole or almost the whole of morality is due to the fact that another, even sterner morality of law, that of Judaism, converted the ancient world. It was, of course, Judaism in the form of Christianity which thus prevailed. But those such as Nietzsche and the Nazis who have understood Christianity as essentially Judaic, have in their hostility perceived a truth which has been disguised from many modern would-be friends of Christianity. For the Torah remains the law uttered by God in the New Testament as in the Old, and on the New Testament view Jesus as Messiah is, as the Council of Trent emphasized in a decree, lawgiver as well as a mediator to whom we owe obedience. If, writes Karl Barth, agreeing in this at least for once with Trent, he were not the judge, he would not be the savior. How then can a morality of implacable law be related to any conception of the virtues? Abelard's retreat into interiority is from the standpoint of his contemporaries a refusal to face the tasks which provide the specific context for their posing of this question. As we have seen, from Abelard's point of view, the external social world was merely a set of contingent and accidental circumstances, but for many of Abelard's contemporaries, it is these circumstances which define the moral task, for they do not inhabit a society in which institutional circumstance can almost be taken for granted. The 12th century is a time when institutions have to be created. It is no accident that John of Salisbury is preoccupied with the question of the character of a statesman. What yet has to be invented in the 12th century is an institutional order in which the demands of a divine law can more easily be heard and lived out in a secular society outside the monasteries. The question of the virtues thus becomes inescapable, 
That is, what kind of man can do this? What type of education can foster this type of man? It is in terms of such questions that the difference between Abelard on the one hand and, for example, Alan of Lilly on the other is perhaps to be understood. Writing in the 1170s, Alan sees the pagan writers not so much as representing a rival moral scheme as providing resources for answering political questions. The virtues of which the pagan writers treat are useful qualities in creating and sustaining an earthly social order. Clarity can transform them into genuine virtues. Sorry, charity can transform them into genuine virtues, the practice of which leads to man's supernatural and heavenly end. So Allen begins a movement to synthesize ancient philosophy and the New Testament. His treatment of Plato and Cicero's texts anticipate Aquinas's use of, the, of parts of Aristotle, which only become available in the later part of the 12th and in the 13th century. But unlike Aquinas, Allen stresses the political and social point of the virtues. What were the political problems whose solution required the practice of virtues? They are the problems of a society in which the central and equitable administration of justice, universities, and other means of sustaining learning and culture, and the kind of civility which peculiarly belongs to urban life, are all still in the process of being created. The institutions which will sustain them have yet for the most part to be invented. The cultural space in which they will be able to exist has yet to be located somewhere between the particular claims of the intense local, uh, local rural community, which threatens to absorb everything into custom and local power and the universal claims of the church. The resources available for this task are slender. Feudal institutions, monastic discipline, the Latin language, ideas once Roman of order and of law, and the new culture of the 12th century Renaissance. How is so little culture going to be able to control so much behavior and invent so many institutions? Part of the answer is as follows. By generating just the right kinds of tension or even conflict, creative rather than destructive, on the whole, and in the long run, between secular and sacred, local and national, Latin and vernacular, rural and urban. It is in the context of such conflicts that moral education goes on and that the virtues come to be valued and redefined. Three aspects of this process need to be emphasized by considering in turn the virtues of loyalty and justice, the military and chivalric virtues and the virtues of purity and patience. It is easy to recognize the key place that loyalty must have in the hierarchies of a feudal society. It is as easy to understand the need for justice in a society of motley competing claims and easy oppression. But loyalty to whom and justice from whom? Consider the conflict between Henry II of England and Archbishop Thomas Becket. Each was a man of energy, hot temper, and impetuosity. Each represented a great cause, although Henry was primarily concerned to increase the royal power, the way in which he did so extended the rule of law in a fundamental sense, replacing feuds, self-help, and local custom by a more stable, centralized, equitable, and just system of courts and officials than had ever existed before. Becket, in turn, represented more than the maneuverings of ecclesiastical power, however much those preoccupied him. Embedded within the self-assertion of episcopal and papal power was the claim that human law is the shadow cast by divine law, that the institutions of law embody the virtues of justice. Becket represents the appeal to an absolute standard that lies beyond all secular and particular codifications. On this medieval view, as on the ancient, there is no room for the modern liberal distinction between law and morality. And there is no room for this because of what the medieval kingdom shares with the polis, as Aristotle conceived it. Both are conceived as communities in which men in company pursue the human good, and not merely as what the modern liberal state takes itself to be, providing the arena in which each individual seeks his or her own private good. 
It follows that in much of the ancient and medieval worlds, as in many other pre-modern societies, the individual is identified and constituted in and through certain of his or her roles, though these roles which bind the individual to the communities in and through which alone specifically human goods are to be attained. I confront the world as a member of this family, this household, this clan, this tribe, this city, this nation, this kingdom. There is no I apart from these. To this it may be replied as follows. What about my immortal soul? Surely in the eyes of God I am an individual prior to and apart from my roles. This rejoinder embodies a misconception which in part arises from a confusion between the Platonic notion of the soul and that of Catholic Christianity. For the Platonist as later for the Cartesian, the soul preceding all body and social existence must indeed possess an identity prior to all social roles. But for the Catholic Christian, as earlier for the Aristotelian, the body and the soul are not two linked substances. I am my body, and my body is social, born to those parents in this community with a specific social identity. What does make a difference for the Catholic Christian is that I, whether earth, whatever earthly community I may belong to, am also held to be a member of a heavenly, eternal community in which I also have a role, a community represented on earth by the church. Of course, I can be expelled from, defect from, or otherwise lose my place in any of these forms of community. I can become an exile, a stranger, a wanderer. These too are assigned social roles recognized within ancient and medieval communities, but it is always as part of an ordered community that I have to seek the human good, and in this sense of community, the solitary uh, anchorite or the shepherd on the remote mountainside is as much a member of a community as is a dweller in cities. Hence, solitariness is no longer what it was for Philo Philocrates. The individual carries his communal roles with him as part of the definition of his self, even into his isolation. Thus, when Henry II and Becket confronted each other, each had to recognize in the other not just an individual will, but an individual who was the bearer of an authoritative role. Becket had to recognize what injustice he owed to the king, and when, in 1164, the king demanded an obedience which he could not give, Becket had the insight to cast himself in the role of one about to be martyred. Before this, the secular power at the very least trembled. No one could be found who had the temerity to deliver the hostile judgment of the royal court to the archbishop. When finally Henry occasioned Becket's death, he could not evade in the end the need to do penance, and I mean by penance something more and other than what was required for his reconciliation to Pope Alexander III. For more than a year before that reconciliation, immediately on the hearing of Becket's death, he took to his own room, in sackcloth and ashes and fasting, and two years later he did public penance at Canterbury and was scourged by the monks. Henry's quarrel with Becket took place within a shared framework of detailed agreement on human and divine justice. Henry's quarrel with Becket was only possible because of their deep shared agreement on what constituted winning and losing for antagonists whose past history had brought them to this point and who occupied the position of king and archbishop. So when Becket was forced into a position where he could dramatically assume the role of martyr, he and Henry were not in disagreement as to the criteria, meaning, and consequences of martyrdom. There is thus a crucial difference between this quarrel and that later quarrel between Henry VIII and Thomas More, in which what is in dispute is precisely how events are to be interpreted. Henry II and Thomas Becket inhabit a single narrative structure. Henry VIII and Thomas Cromwell, on the other hand, and Thomas More and Reginald Pole and the other inhabit rival conceptual worlds and tell, as they act and after they act, different and incompatible stories about what they do. 
in the medieval choral agreement and narrative understanding is manifested also in agreement about the virtues and vices. In the Tudor quarrel, that framework of medieval agreement has already been lost, and it was that framework which the medieval Aristotelians tried to articulate. In so doing, they had, of course, to recognize virtues of which Aristotle knew nothing. One of these merits special consideration. It is the theological virtue of charity. Aristotle, in considering the nature of friendship, had concluded that a, that a good man could not be the friend of a bad man. And since the bond of authentic friendship is a shared allegiance to the good, this is unsurprising. But at the center of biblical religion is the conception of a love for those who sin. What is it that Aristotle's universe omits which makes the notion of such a love inconceivable within it? In the course of trying to understand the relationship of a morality of virtues to one of law, I suggested earlier that the context which needed to be supplied to make that relationship intelligible was that of a form of community constituted by the shared project of achieving a common good and thus needing to recognize both a set of types of quality of character conducive to achieving that good, the virtues, and a set of types of action breaching the relationships necessary to form uh, to such a form of community, the offenses to be prosecuted by the community's law. The appropriate response to the latter was punishment, and this is how human societies do generally respond to such types of action. But in the culture of the Bible, in contrast to that of Aristotle, an alternative response became available, that of forgiveness. What is the condition of forgiveness? It requires that the offender already accepts as just the verdict of the law upon his action and behaves as one who acknowledges the justice of the appropriate punishment, hence the common root of penance and of punishment, the words penance and punishment. The offender can then be forgiven if the person offended against so wills. The practice of forgiveness presupposes the practices of justice but there is this crucial difference. Justice is characteristically administered by a judge, an impersonal authority representing the whole community. But forgiveness can only be extended by the offended party. The virtue exhibited in forgiveness is charity. There is no word in the Greek of Aristotle's age correctly translating, there is no word in the Greek of Aristotle's age correctly translated sin, repentance, or charity. Charity is not, of course, from the biblical point of view, just one more virtue to be added to the list. Its inclusion alters the conception of the good for man in a radical way. For the community in which the good is achieved has to be one of reconciliation. It is thus a community with a history of a particular kind. In the discussion of the conception and role of the virtues in heroic societies, I emphasize the connection between that conception and role and the way in which human life is understood as embodying a certain type of narrative structure. It is now possible, tentatively, to generalize that thesis. Every particular view of the virtues is linked to some particular notion of the narrative structure or structures of human life. In the high medieval scheme, a central genre is the tale of a quest or journey. Man is essentially in via, that is, on the way. The end which he seeks is something which, if gained, can redeem all that was wrong with his life up to that point. This notion of man's end is, of course, not Aristotelian in at least two crucial ways. First, Aristotle takes the telos of human life to be a certain kind of life. The telos is not something to be achieved at some future point, but in the way our whole life is constructed. It is true that the good life, which is the telos, culminates in the contemplation of the divine, and therefore for Aristotle's as for the medievals, the good life moves to a climax. Nonetheless, if such scholars as J. L. Acreel are correct, pages 16 to 18, Aristotle's discussion of the place of contemplation is still situated within an account of the good life as a whole, in which a variety of human excellences have to be achieved at the various relevant stages. This is why the notion of a final redemption of an almost entirely unregenerate life has no place in Aristotle's scheme. 
the story of the thief on the cross is unintelligible in Aristotelian terms. And it is unintelligible precisely because charity is not a virtue for Aristotle. Secondly, the notion of human life as a quest or a journey in which a variety of forms of evil are encountered and overcome requires a conception of evil to which there are at most only intimations in Aristotle's writing. To be vicious is, on Aristotle's view, to fail to be virtuous. All badness of character is defect, is deprivation. It is therefore very difficult in Aristotelian terms to distinguish between failure to be good on the one hand and positive evil on the other, between the character of a Henry II and that of a Giles de Rites, or between that in every one of us which is potentially one or the other. This dimension of evil is one which St. Augustine had to face uh, had had to face in a way that Aristotle did not. Augustine followed the Neoplatonic tradition in understanding all evil as a privation of good, but he sees the evil of human nature in the consent which the will gives to evil, a consent prior to because presupposed in every particular explicit set of choices. Evil is somehow or other such, and the human will is somehow or other such that the will can delight in evil. This evil is expressed in defiance of divine law and of human law insofar as it is the mirror of divine law. For to consent to evil is precisely to will to offend against the law. The narrative, therefore, in which human life is embodied has a form in which the subject, which may, which may be one or more individual persons, or for example, the people of Israel, or the citizens of Rome, is set a task in the completion of which lies their peculiar appropriation of the human good. The way towards the completion of that task is barred by a variety of inward and outward evils. The virtues are those qualities which enable the evils to be overcome, the task to be accomplished, the journey to be completed. Thus, Although the conception of the virtues remains teleological, it is a very different conception from Aristotle's in at least two important ways over and above its Christian and Augustinian understanding of evil. First, Aristotle takes it that the possibility of achieving the human good, eudaimonia, can be frustrated by external misfortune. The virtues he grants will enable one to a large degree to cope with adversity, but great misfortunes, such as Priam's exclusion, such as Priam's exclude one from eudaimonia, as do ugliness, low birth, and childlessness. What matters in the medieval perspective is not only the belief that no human being is excluded from the human good by such characteristics, but also that the belief that no evil whatsoever can happen to us needs exclude us either, if we do not become its accomplice. Secondly, the medieval vision is historical in a way that Aristotle's could not be. It situates our aiming at the good not just in specific contexts. Aristotle situates that aiming within the polis, but in contexts which themselves have a history. To move towards the good is to move in time. And that movement may itself involve new understandings of what it is to move towards the good. Modern historians of the Middle Ages and the narratives which the greatest writers use to describe that journey, which they use to, which they take to be man's life, are fictional and allegorical. But that is in part because medieval thinkers took the basic historical scheme of the Bible to be one within which they could rest assured. They did indeed lack a conception of history as invoking a continuous discovery and rediscovery of what history is, but they did not thereby lack a conception of human life as historical. The virtues are then, on this kind of medieval view, those qualities which enable men to survive evils on their historical journey. I have already emphasized that medieval societies are in general societies of conflict, lawlessness, and multiplicity. John Gardner has written of the 15th century circle around John of Gaunt, Edward III of England's fourth son, what they desired of their world was law and order, firm and unchallenged monarchy, 
or in Dante's phrase, the one will that resolves the many. What they saw all around them and ardently hated was instability, debased values, endless struggle, a mad commingling of high and low, not oneness but manyness. What Chaucer would describe in his magnificent elaboration of a poem by Boethius as a cosmic fornication. This passage suggests a common ambiguity in the medieval vision of the moral life. On the one hand, that life is informed by an idealized view of the world as an integrated order in which the temporal mirrors the eternal. Every particular item has its due place in the order of things. This is that intellectual vision of total system which finds its supreme expression in Dante and in Aquinas, but to which a great deal of ordinary medieval thought continuously aspires. Yet even medieval thought, let alone medieval life, finds it difficult to be entirely systematic. There is not only the difficulty of fitting together the feudal with its inheritances from the heroic and the Christian, but there is also the tension between the Bible and Aristotle. Aquinas in his treatise on the virtues treats of them in terms of what had become the conventional scheme of the cardinal virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, courage, and the triad of theological virtues. But what, what then of, for example, patience? Aquinas quotes the epistle of St. James, patience has its perfect work, and considers whether patience should not therefore be listed as a principal virtue. But then Cicero is quoted against St. James, and it is argued that all the other virtues are contained within the four cardinal virtues. Yet if this is so, Aquinas cannot of course mean by the Latin names of the cardinal virtues entirely what Aristotle meant by their Greek equivalents, since one or more of the cardinal virtues must contain within itself both patience and another biblical virtue, which Aquinas explicitly acknowledges, acknowledges namely humility. Yet in the only place in Aristotle's account of the virtues where anything resembling humility is mentioned, it is a vice, and patience is not mentioned at all by Aristotle. Even this does not suggest the range and variety that is to be found in medieval treatments of the virtues. When, Giot when Giotto represented the virtues and vices at Padua, he presented them in pairs, and the pairs by their original and imaginative forms of visual presentation suggest that a new mode of imagining may itself be a form of rethinking. And, Brins and uh, Brennanson argued that, in his frescoes of such vices as avarice and injustice, Giotto answered the question, what are the significant traits in the appearance of someone exclusively dominated by each of the vices? His visual answers represent a view of the vices that both seems to argue with and to presuppose the Aristotelian scheme. There could not be more striking evidence of the heterogeneity of medieval thought. Even ideal synthesis is therefore to some degree precarious. In medieval practice, bringing the virtues to bear on the conflicts and evils of medieval life produces in different circumstances quite different perspectives on the rank order of the virtues. Patience and purity can become very important indeed. Purity is crucially important because the medieval one is one which recognizes how easily any grasp of the notion of a supreme good may be lost by worldly distraction. Patience, too, is crucial because it is the virtue of endurance in the face of evil. An English 14th century poet who was preoccupied with these themes wrote one poem, Pearl, in which a man who in a dream encounters the ghost of his dead, of his dead daughter finds himself loving her more than he loves God. And another, Patience, in which Jonah is at first distressed by God's putting off the destruction of the Nivea because the delay is casting doubt on his Jonah's prophecies, but has to learn that it is only because God is patient and slow to anger that this wicked world is allowed to survive at all. The medieval consciousness is one which recognizes its hold upon the conception of the supreme good as always fragile and always threatened. The medieval world, then, is one in which not only is the scheme of the virtues enlarged beyond an Aristotelian perspective, but above all in which the connection between the distinctively narrative element in human life and the character of the vices comes to the forefront of consciousness and not only in biblical terms. At this point, therefore, a crucial question has to be posed. 
If so much of medieval theory and practice is at odds with certain central theses advanced by Aristotle, in what sense was that theory and practice Aristotelian, if at all? Or, to put the same point in another way, does not my account of Aquinas, uh, sorry, does not my account of medieval thinking about the virtues make a strict Aristotelian, such as Aquinas, a highly deviant medieval figure? It does indeed, and it is worth picking out some central features of Aquinas' treatment of the virtues which make of Aquinas an unexpectedly marginal figure in the history which I am writing. This is not to deny Aquinas' crucial role in an inter as an interpreter of Aristotle. Aquinas' commentary on the Nicomachean Ethics has never been bettered. But at key points, Aquinas adopts a mode of treatment of the virtues which is questionable. There is first of all his overall scheme of classification which I have already remarked. Aquinas presents the table of virtues in terms of what is presented as an exhaustive and consistent classificatory scheme. Such large classificatory schemes ought always to arouse our suspicions. A Linnaeus or a Mendeleev may indeed have grasped by a brilliant intuition an ordering of the empirical materials which is vindicated by a later theory. But where our knowledge is genuinely empirical, we have to be careful not to confuse what we have learnt empirically with what is inferred from theory, even from true theory. And a good deal of our knowledge of the virtues is in this way empirical. That is, we learn what kind of quality truthfulness or courage is, what its practice amounts to, what obstacles it creates, and what it avoids, and so on, only in key part by observing its practice in others and in ourselves. And since we have to be educated into the virtues, and most of us are incompletely and unevenly educated in them for a good part of our lives, there is necessarily a kind of empirical untidiness in the way that our knowledge of the virtues is, order, is ordered, more particularly in respect of how the practice of each relates to the practice of all the others. In the face of these considerations, Aquinas' treatment of the classification of the virtues and his consequent treatment of their unity raises questions to which we find in his text no answer. For, on the one hand, the theoretical backing for his classificatory scheme has two parts. That is, one is a reiteration of the Aristotelian cosmology and the other is specifically Christian and theological. Yet we have every reason to reject Aristotle's physical and biological science, and the part of Christian theology which connects, which concerns man's true end, and which is not Aristotelian metaphysics, is on Aquinas' own account a matter of faith, not of reason. Consider in this light Aquinas' claim that if we encounter genuine moral conflict, it is always because of some previous wrong action of our own. Clearly, this is one source of conflict. But will it cover Antigone and Creon, Odysseus and Philoketes, or even Oedipus? Will it cover Henry II and Thomas Becket? For we have to be clear that if the kind of account of these situations which I have given is even roughly correct, each of, them, each of these conflicts could as genuinely be within a single individual as between individuals. Aquinas' point of view, like Aristotle's, precludes tragedy that is not the outcome of human flaws, of sin and error. And unlike Aristotle, this is the outcome of a theology which holds that the world and man were made good and are only flawed as the result of acts of human will. When such a theology is aligned to an Aristotelian account of knowledge of the natural world, it requires a scientia of both the physical and the moral order, a form of knowledge in which every item can be placed in a deductive hierarchy in which the highest place is taken by a set of first principles, the truth of which can be known with certainty. But there is a problem for anyone holding this Aristotelian view of knowledge, a problem which has engaged many commentators. For on Aristotle's own account, the generalizations of politics and ethics are not such as would fit into such a deductive account. They hold not necessarily and universally, but only ho epi to polo, generally, and for the most part. But if this is true, then we ought not to expect to be able to give, or want to be able to give, the kind of account of the virtues which Aquinas gives us. What is at stake here is moral as well as epistemological. P.T. Geach, a contemporary follower of Aquinas, on this at least, 
has presented the problem of the unity of the virtues in the following way. Suppose it is claimed that someone whose aims and purposes were generally evil, a devoted and intelligent Nazi, for example, possesses the virtue of courage. We ought to reply, says Geech, that either it was not courage that he possessed, or that in that kind of case courage is not a virtue. This kind of reply is clearly one that must be made by anyone who holds anything like Aquinas' view of the unity of the virtues. What is wrong with it? Consider what will be involved, what was in fact involved in the moral re-education of such a Nazi. That is, there were many vices that he had to unlearn, many virtues about which he had to learn. Humility and charity would, in, would be in most ways, if not quite in every way, new to him. But it is crucial that he would not have to unlearn or relearn what he knew about avoiding both cowardice and intemperate rashness in the face of harm and danger. Moreover, it was, it was precisely because such a Nazi was not devoid of the virtues that there was a point of moral contact between him and those who had the task of re-educating him, that there was something on which to build. To deny that that kind of Nazi was courageous or that his courage was a virtue, obliterates the distinction between what required moral re-education in such persons and what did not. Thus I take it that if any version of moral Aristotelianism were necessarily committed to a strong thesis connecting concerning the unity of the virtues, as not only Aquinas but Aristotle himself were, there would be a serious defect in that position. It is therefore important to stress both that Aristotle's version, that Aquinas's version of Aristotle and the virtues is not the only possible version, and that Aquinas is an uncharacteristic medieval thinker, even if the greatest of medieval theorists. And my own emphasis on the variety and untidiness of medieval uses of, extensions of, and emendations to Aristotle is essential to understanding how medieval thinking was not only part of, but marked a genuine advance in the tradition of moral theory and practice which I am describing. Nonetheless, the medieval stage in that tradition was in a strong sense Aristotelian and not only in its Christian versions. When Maimonides encountered the question as to why God and the Torah had instituted so many holidays, he replied that it was because holidays provide opportunities for the making of growth of friendship and that Aristotle had pointed out that the virtue of friendship is the bond of human community. It is this linking of a biblical historical perspective with an Aristotelian one in the treatment of the virtues, which is the unique achievement of the Middle Ages in Jewish and Islamic as well as in Christian. Chapter 14, The Nature of the Virtues. Run, one response to the history, which I have narrated so far, might well be to suggest that even within the relatively coherent tradition of thought which I have sketched, there are just too many different and incompatible conceptions of a virtue for there to be any real unity to the concept, or indeed to the history. Homer, Sophocles, Aristotle, the New Testament, and medieval thinkers differ from each other in too many different ways. They offer us different and incompatible lists of the virtues. They give a different rank order of importance to different virtues, and they have different and incompatible theories of the virtues. If we were to consider later Western, if we were to consider later Western writers on the virtues, the list of differences and incompatibilities would be enlarged still further. And if we extended our inquiry to Japanese, say, or American Indian cultures, the differences would become greater still. It would be all too easy to conclude that there are a number of rival and alternative conceptions of the virtues, but even within the tradition which I have been delineating, no single core conception. The case for such a conclusion could not be better constructed than by beginning from a consideration of the very different lists of items which different authors in different times and places have included in their catalog of virtues. Some of these catalogs, Homer's, Aristotle's, and the New Testament's, I've already noticed at greater length or lesser length. Let me, at the risk of some repetition, recall some of their key features and then introduce for further comparison the catalogs of two later Western writers, Benjamin Franklin and Jane Austen. The first example is that of Homer. 
At least some of the items in a Homeric list of the Aratai would clearly not be counted by most of us nowadays as virtues at all, physical strength being the most obvious example. To this, it might be replied that perhaps we ought not to translate the word arate in Homer by our word virtue, but instead by our word excellence. And perhaps, if we were so to translate it, the apparently surprising difference between Homer and ourselves would at first sight have been removed. For we could allow without any difficulty, um, we, for we could allow without any kind of oddity that the possession of physical strength is a possession of an excellence. But in fact, we would not have removed, but instead would merely have relocated the difference between Homer and ourselves. For we would now see for we would now seem to be saying that Homer's concept of an arete and excellence is one thing, and that our concept of a virtue is quite another, since a peculiar quality can be an excellence in Homer's eyes, but not a virtue in ours, and vice versa. But of course, it is not that Homer's list of virtues differs only from our own. It, is, it also notably differs from Aristotle's, and Aristotle's, of course, also differs from our own. For one thing, as I noticed earlier, some Greek virtue words are not easily translated into English, or rather out of Greek. Moreover, consider the importance of friendship as a virtue in Aristotle's list. How different from us, or the, places, or the place of phronesis, how different from Homer and from us. The mind receives from Aristotle the kind of tribute which the body receives from Homer. But it is just not the case that the difference between Aristotle and Homer lies in the inclusion of some items and the omissions of others in their respective catalogues. It turns out also in the way in which those catalogues are ordered, in which items are ranked as relatively central to human excellence, and which marginal. Moreover, the relationship of virtues to the social order has changed. For Homer, the paradigm of human excellence is the warrior. For Aristotle, it is the Athenian gentleman. Indeed, according to Aristotle, certain virtues are only available to those of great riches and of high social status. There are virtues which are unavailable to the poor man, even if he is a free man. And those virtues are, on Aristotle's view, one central to human life, magnanimity. And once again, any translation of meglosukia is unsatisfactory. And munificence are not just virtues, but important virtues within the Aristotelian scheme. At once it is impossible to delay the remark that the most striking contrast with Aristotle's catalog is to be found neither in Homer nor in our own, but in the New Testaments. For the New Testament not only praises virtues of which Aristotle knows nothing, faith, hope, and love, and says nothing about virtues such as phronesis, which are crucial for Aristotle, but it praises at least one quality as a virtue, which Aristotle seems to count as one of the vices relative to magnanimity, namely humility. Moreover, since the New Testament quite clearly sees the rich as destined for the pains of hell, it is clear that the, vir that the key virtues cannot be available to them, yet they are available to slaves. And the New Testament, of course, differs from both Homer and Aristotle not only in the items included in its catalog, but once again in its rank ordering of the virtues. Turn now to compare all three lists of virtues considered so far, the Homeric, the Aristotelian, and the New Testament, with two much later lists, one which can be compiled from Jane Austen's novels, and the other which Benjamin Franklin constructed for himself. Two features stand out in Jane Austen's list. The first is the importance that she allots to the virtue she calls constancy, a virtue about which I shall say more in a later chapter. In some ways, constancy plays a role in Jane Austen analogous to that of phronesis in Aristotle. It is a virtue the possession of which is a prerequisite for the possession of other virtues. The second is the fact that what Aristotle treats as the virtue of agreeableness, a virtue for which he says there is no name, she treats as only the simulacrum of a genuine virtue. The genuine virtue in question is the one she calls amiability. For the man who practices agreeableness does so from consideration of honor and expediency, according to Aristotle, whereas Jane Austen 
thought it possible and necessary for the possessor of that virtue to have a certain real affection for people as such. It matters here that Jane Austen is a Christian. Remember that Aristotle himself had treated military courage as a, sim as a simulacrum of true courage. Thus we find here yet another type of disagreement over the virtues, namely one as to which human qualities are genuine virtues and which mere simulacra. In Benjamin Franklin's list, we find almost all the types of differences from at least one of the catalogs we have considered and one more. Franklin includes virtues which are new to our considerations, such as cleanliness, silence, and industry. He clearly considers the drive to acquire itself a part of virtue, whereas for most ancient Greeks, this is the vice of pleonexia. He treats some virtues which earlier ages had considered minor as major, but he also redefines some familiar virtues. In the list of 13 virtues which Franklin compiled as part of his system of private moral accounting, he elucidates each virtue by citing a maxim obedience to which is the virtue in question. In the case of chastity, the maxim is rarely use venery, but for health or offspring, never to dullness, weakness, or the injury of your own or another's peace or reputation. This is clearly not what earlier writers had meant by chastity. We have therefore accumulated a startling number of differences and incompatibilities in the five stated and implied accounts of the virtues. So the question which I raised at the outset becomes more urgent. If different writers in different times and places, but all within the history of Western culture, include such different sets and types of items in their lists, what grounds have we for supposing that they do indeed aspire to list items of one and the same kind, that there is any shared concept at all? A second kind of consideration reinforces the presumption of a negative answer to this question. It is not just that each of these five writers lists different and different kinds of items. It is also that each of these lists embodies is the expression of a different theory about what a virtue is. In the Homeric poems, a virtue is a quality the manifestation of which enables someone to do exactly what their well-defined social role requires. The primary role is that of the warrior king and that Homer lists those virtues which he does which he does becomes intelligible at once when we recognize that the key virtues, therefore, must be those which enable a man to excel in combat and in the games. It follows that we cannot identify Homer, it follows that we cannot identify the Homeric virtues until we have identified the key social roles in Homeric society and the requirements of each of them. The concept of what anyone filling such and such a role ought to do is prior to the concept of a virtue. The latter concept has application only via the former. On Aristotle's account, matters are very different. Even though some virtues are available only to certain types of people, nonetheless, virtues attach not to men as inhabiting social roles, but to men as such. It is the telos of man as a species which determines what human qualities are virtues. We need to remember, however, that although Aristotle treats the acquisition and exercise of the virtues as a means to an end, the relationships of means to end is internal and not external. I call a means internal to a given end when the end cannot be adequately characterized independently of a characterization of the means. So it is what the virtues and the telos, which is the good life for man on Aristotle's so, so it is with the virtues and the telos, which is the good life for man on Aristotle's account. The exercise of the virtues is itself a crucial component of the good life for man. The distinction between internal and external means to an end is not drawn by Aristotle himself in the Nicomachean Ethics, as I noticed earlier, but it is an essential distinction to be drawn if we are to understand what Aristotle intended. The distinction is drawn explicitly by Aquinas in the course of his defense of St. Augustine's definition of a virtue, and it is clear that Aquinas understood that in drawing it, he was maintaining an Aristotelian point of view. The New Testament's account of the virtues, even if it differs as much as it does in content from Aristotle's, Aristotle certainly would not have admired Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ and he would have been horrified 
by St. Paul does have the same logical and conceptual structure as Aristotle's account. A virtue is, as with Aristotle, a quality the exercise of which leads to the achievement of the human telos. The good for man is, of course, a supernatural and not only a natural good, but supernature redeems and completes nature. Moreover, the relationship of virtues as means to the end which is the human incorporation, the divine kingdom of the age to come, is internal and not external, just as it is in Aristotle. It is, of course, this parallelism which allows Aquinas to synthesize Aristotle in the New Testament. A key figure of this parallelism is the way in which the concept of the good life for man is prior to the concept of a virtue in just the way in which, on the Homeric account, the, con the concept of a social role was prior. Once again, it is the way in which the former concept is applied which determines how the latter is to be applied. In both cases, the concept of a virtue is a secondary concept. The intent of Jane Austen's theory of the virtues is of another kind. C.S. Lewis has rightly emphasized how profoundly Christian her moral, version, her moral vision is, and Gilbert Ryle has equally rightly emphasized her inheritance from Shaftesbury and from Aristotle. In fact, her views combine elements from Homer as well, since she is concerned with social roles in a way that neither the New Testament nor Aristotle are. She is therefore important for the way in which she finds it possible to combine what are at first sight disparate theoretical accounts of the virtues. But for the moment, any attempt to assess the significance of Jane Austen's synthesis must be delayed. Instead, we must notice the quite different style of theory articulated in Benjamin Franklin's account of the virtues. Franklin's account, like Aristotle's, is teleological, but unlike Aristotle's, it is utilitarian. According to Franklin in his autobiography, the virtues are means to an end, but he envisages the means-end relationship as external rather than internal. The end to which the cultivation of the virtues ministers is happiness, but happiness is understood as success prosperity in Philadelphia, and ultimately in heaven. The virtues are to be useful, and Franklin's account continually stresses utility as a criterion in individual cases. Make no expense but to do good to others or yourself, that is to say, waste nothing. Speak not but what may benefit others or yourself. Avoid trifling conversation, and, as we have already seen, rarely use venery, but for health or offspring. When Franklin was in Paris, he was horrified by Parisian architecture. Marble, porcelain, and gilt are squandered without utility. We thus have at least three very different conceptions of a virtue to confront. A virtue is a quality which enables an individual to discharge his or her social role, Homer, a virtue is a quality which enables an individual to move towards the achievement of the specifically human telos, whether natural or supernatural, Aristotle, the New Testament, and Aquinas. And a virtue is a quality which has utility in achieving earthly and, heaven, and heavenly success, Franklin. Are we to take these as three different rivals' accounts of the same thing? Or are they instead accounts of three different things? Perhaps the moral structures in archaic Greece in 4th century Greece and in 18th century Pennsylvania were so different from each other that we should treat them as embodying quite different concepts, whose difference is initially disguised from us by the historical accident of an inherited vocabulary which misleads us by linguistic resemblance long after conceptual identity and similarity have failed. Our initial question has come back to us with redoubled force. Yet, Although I have dwelt upon the prima facie case for holding that the, different, that the differences and incompatibilities between different accounts at least suggest that there is no single, central, core conception of the virtues which might make a claim for universal allegiance, I ought also to point out that each of the five moral accounts which I have sketched so summarily does embody just such a claim. It is indeed just this feature of those accounts that makes them of more than sociological or antiquarian interest. Every one of these accounts claims not only theoretical, but also institutional hegemony. For Odysseus, the Cyclops, 
the Cyclopses stand condemned because they lack agriculture, an agra and a themis. For Aristotle, the barbarians stand condemned because they lack the polis and are therefore incapable of politics. For New Testament Christians, there is no salvation outside the apostolic church. And we know that Benjamin Franklin found the virtues more at home in Philadelphia than in Paris, and that for Jane Austen, the touchstone of the virtues is a certain kind of marriage and indeed a certain kind of naval officer, that is, a certain kind of English naval officer. The question can therefore now be posed directly. Are we or are we not able to disentangle from these rival and various claims a unitary core concept of the virtues of which we can give a more compelling account than any of the other accounts so far. I am going to argue that we can in fact discover such a core concept and that it turns out to provide the tradition of which I have written the history which the history with its conceptual unity. It will indeed enable us to distinguish in a clear way those beliefs about the virtues which genuinely belong to the tradition from those which do not. Unsurprisingly, perhaps it is a complex concept, different parts of which derive from different stages in the development of the tradition. Thus, the concept itself, in some sense, embodies the history of which it is the outcome. One of the features of the concept of a virtue which has emerged with some clarity from the argument so far is that it always requires for its application the acceptance of some prior account of certain features of social and moral life in terms of which it has to be defined and explained. So in the Homeric account, the concept of a virtue is secondary to that of a social role. In Aristotle's account, it is secondary to that of the good life for man, conceived as the telos of human action. And in Franklin's much later account, it is secondary to that of utility. What is it in the account which I'm about to give, which provides in a similar way the necessary background against which the concept of a virtue has to be made intelligible? It is in answering this question that the complex historical, multi-layered character of the core concept of virtue becomes clear. For there are no less than three stages in the logical development of the concept which have to be identified in order, if the core conception of a virtue is to be understood. And each of these stages has its own conceptual background. The first stage requires a background account of what I shall call a practice. The second stage, an account of what I have already characterized as the narrative order of a single human life, and the third, an account of a good deal fuller than I have given up to now of what constitutes a moral tradition. Each later stage presupposes the earlier, but not vice versa. Each earlier stage is both modified by and reinterpreted in the light of, but also provides an essential constituent of each later stage. The progress in the development of the concept is closely related to, although it does not recapitulate in any straightforward way, the history of the tradition of which it forms the core. In the Homeric account of the virtues, and in Homeric societies more generally, the exercise of a virtue exhibits qualities which are required for sustaining a, po a social role and for exhibiting excellence in some well-marked area of social practice. That is, to excel is to excel at war or in the games, as Achilles does in, in, in sustaining a household as Penelope, as Penelope does in giving counsel in the assembly as Nestor does in, telling, in the telling of a tale as Homer himself does. When Aristotle speaks of excellence in human activity, he sometimes, though not always, refers to some well-defined type of, of human practice, that is, flute playing or war or geometry. I am going to suggest that this notion of a particular type of practice is providing the arena in which the virtues are exhibited and in terms of which they are to receive their primary, if incomplete, definition is crucial to the whole enterprise of identifying a core concept of the virtues. I hasten to add two caveats, however. The first is to point out that my argument will not in any way imply that virtues are only exercised in the course of what I am calling practices. The second is to warn that I shall be using the word practice in a specially defined way, which does not, which does not completely agree with current ordinary usage, including my own previous use of that word. What, I'm going to, what am I going to mean by it? By 
of practice, I am going to mean any coherent and complex form of socially established cooperative human activity through which goods internal to that form of activity are realized in the course of trying to achieve those standards of excellence which are appropriate to, which are appropriate to and partially definitive of that form of activity with the result that human powers to achieve excellence and human conceptions of the end and goods involved are systematically extended. Tic-tac-toe is not ex an example of a practice in this sense, nor is throwing a football with skill, but the game of football is, and so is chess. Bricklaying is not a practice, architecture is. Planting turnips is not a practice, farming is. So are the inquiries of physics, chemistry, and biology, and so is the work of the historian, and so are painting and music. In the ancient and medieval worlds, the creation and sustaining of human communities, of households, cities, nations, is generally taken to be a practice in the sense in which I have defined it. Thus, the range of practices is wide. Arts, sciences, games, politics, in the Aristotelian sense, the making and sustaining of family life all thunder, fall under the concept. But the question of the precise range of practices is not at this stage of the first importance. Instead, let me explain some of the key terms involved in my definition, beginning with the notion of goods internal to a practice. Consider the example of a highly intelligent seven-year-old child whom I wish to teach to play chess although the child has no particular desire to learn the game. The child does, however, have a very strong desire for candy and little chance of obtaining it. I therefore tell the child that if the child will play chess with me once a week, I will give the child 50 cents worth of candy. Moreover, I tell the child that I will always play in such a way that it will be difficult but not impossible for the child to win, and that if the child wins, the child will receive an extra 50 cents worth of candy. Thus motivated, the child plays and plays to win. Notice, however, that so long as it is the candy alone which provides the child with a good reason for playing chess, the child has no reason not to cheat and every reason to cheat, provided he or she can do so successfully. But, so we may hope, there will come a time when the child will find in those goods specific to chess, in the achievement of a certain highly particular kind of analytical skill, strategic imagination, and competitive intensity, a new set of reasons, reasons now not just for winning on a particular occasion, but for trying to excel in whatever way the game of chess demands. Now, if that child cheats, he or she will be defeating not me, but in himself or herself. There are thus two kinds of good possibly to be gained by playing chess. On the one hand, there are those goods externally and contingently attached to chess playing and to other practices by the accidents of social circumstance. In the case of the imaginary child candy and in the case of real adults such, as goods, such goods as prestige, status, and money. There are always alternative ways for achieving such goods and their achievement is never to be had only by engaging in some particular kind of practice. On the other hand, there are the goods internal to the practice of chess which cannot be had in any way but by playing chess or some other game of that specific kind. We call them internal for two reasons. First, as I have already suggested, because we can only specify them in terms of chess or some other game of that specific kind and by means of examples from such games. Otherwise, the meagerness of a vocabulary for speaking of such goods forces us into such devices as my own resort to writing of a certain highly particular kind of. And secondly, because they can only be identified and recognized by the experience of participating in the practice in question. Those who lack the relevant experience are incompetent thereby as judges of internal goods. This is clearly the case with all the major examples of practices. That is, consider, for example, even if briefly and inadequately, the practice of portrait painting as it developed in Western Europe from the late Middle Ages to the 18th century.
The successful portrait painter is able to achieve many goods which are, in the sense just defined, external to the practice of portrait painting. Fame, wealth, social status, even a measure of power and influence at courts upon occasion. But those external goods are not to be confused with the goods which are internal to the practice. The internal goods are those which result from an extended attempt to show how Wittgenstein's dictum, the human body is the best picture of the human soul, might be made to become true by teaching us to regard the picture on our wall as the object itself, the men, landscape, and so on depicted there, in a way quite new. What is misleading about Wittgenstein's dictum as it stands is its neglect of the truth in George Orwell's thesis. At 50, everyone has, at 50, everyone has the face he deserves. What painters from Giotto to Rembrandt learned to show how, what, what painters from Giotto to Rembrandt learned to show was how the face at any age may, re, may be revealed as the face that the subject of a portrait deserves. Originally, in medieval painting of the saints, the face was a calm. The question of a resemblance between the depicted face of, of Christ or St. Peter and the face that Jesus or Peter actually possessed at some particular age did not even arise. The antithesis to this iconography was the relative naturalism of certain 15th century Flemish and German paintings. The heavy eyelids, the coiffed hair, the lines around the mouth, undeniably represent some particular woman, either actual or envisaged. Resemblance has usurped the iconic relationship. But with Rembrandt there is, so to speak, synthesis. The naturalistic portrait is now rendered as an icon, but an icon of a new and hitherto inconceivable kind. Similarly, in a very different kind of sequence, mythological faces in a certain kind of 17th century French painting become aristocratic faces in the 18th century. Within each of these sequences, at least two different kinds of good internal to the painting of human faces and bodies are achieved. There is, first of all, the excellence of the products, both the excellence in the performance by the painters and that of each portrait itself. This excellence, the very verb excel suggested, has to be understood historically. The sequences of development find their point and purpose in progress towards and beyond a variety of types and modes of excellence. There are, of course, sequences of decline as well as of progress, and progress is rarely to be understood as straightforwardly linear. But it is in participation in the attempts to sustain progress and to respond creatively to problems that the second kind of good internal to the practices of portrait painting is to be found. For what the artist discovers within the pursuit of excellence in portrait painting and what is true of portrait painting is true of the practice of the fine arts in general is the good of a certain kind of life. That life may not constitute the whole of life for someone who is a painter by a very long way or it may at least for a period. Gauguin like absorb him or be at the expense of almost everything else but it is the painter's living out of a greater or lesser part of his or her life as a painter that is the second kind of good internal to painting. And judgment upon these goods requires at the very least the kind of competence that is only to be acquired either as a painter or as someone willing to learn systematically what the portrait painter has to teach. A practice involves standards of excellence and obedience to rules as well as the achievement of goods. To enter into a practice is to accept the authority of those standards and the inadequacy of my own performance as judged by them. It is to subject my own attitudes, choices, preferences, and tastes to the standards which currently and partially define the practice. Practices, of course, as I have just noticed, have a history. That is, games, sciences, and arts all have histories. Thus, the standards are not themselves immune from criticism. But nonetheless, we cannot be initiated into a practice without accepting the authority of the best standards realized so far. If, on starting to listen to music, I do not accept my own incapacity to judge correctly, I will never learn to hear, let alone to appreciate, Bartok's last quartets. If, on starting to play baseball, 
I do not accept that others know better than I when to throw a fastball and when not. I will never learn to appreciate good pitching, let alone to pitch. In the realm of practices, the authority of both goods and standards operates in such a way as to rule out all subjectivist and emotivist analyses of judgment. De gustibus est disputandum. We are now in a position to notice an important difference between what I have called internal and what I have called external goods. It is characteristic of what I have called external goods that when achieved, they are always some individual's property and possession. Moreover, characteristically, they are such that the more someone has of them, the less there is for other people. This is sometimes necessarily the case, as with power and fame, and sometimes the case by reason of contingent circumstance, as with money. External goods are therefore characteristically objects of competition in which there must be losers as well as winners. Internal goods are indeed the outcome of competition to excel, but it is characteristic of them that their achievement is a good for the whole community who participate in the practice. So when Turner transformed the seascape in painting or W.G. Grace advanced the art of batting in cricket in quite a new way, their achievement enriched the whole relevant community. But what does all or any of this have to do with the concept of the virtues? It turns out that we are now in a position to formulate a first, even if partial, and tentative definition of a virtue. A virtue is an acquired, oh, sorry, a virtue is an acquired human quality, the possession and exercise of which tends to enable us to achieve those goods which are internal to practices and the lack of which effectively prevents us from achieving any such goods. Later, this definition will need amplification and amendment. But as a first approximation to an adequate definition, it already illuminates the place of the virtues in human life. For it is not difficult to show for a whole range of key virtues that without them, the goods internal to practices are barred to us, but not just barred to us generally, barred in a very particular way. It belongs to the concept of a practice, as I have outlined it, and as we are familiar with it already in our actual lives, whether we are painters or physicists or quarterbacks or indeed just lovers of good painting or first-rate experiments or well-thrown or well-thrown pass, that its goods can only be achieved by subordinating ourselves within the practice in our relationship to other practitioners. We have to learn to recognize what is due to whom. We have to be prepared to take whatever self-endangering risks are demanded along the way, and we have to listen carefully to what we are told about our own inadequacies and to reply with the same carefulness for the facts. In other words, we have to accept as necessary components of any practice with internal goods and standards of excellence the virtues of justice, courage, and honesty. For not to accept these, to be willing to cheat as our imagined child was willing to cheat in his or her early days at chess, so far bars us from achieving the standards of excellence or the goods internal to the practice that it renders the practice pointless except as a device for achieving external goods. We can put the same point in another way. Every practice requires a certain kind of relationship between those who participate in it. Now, the virtues are those goods by reference to which, whether we like it or not, we define our relationships to those other people with whom we share the kind of purposes and standards which inform practices. Consider an example of how reference to the virtues has to be made in certain kinds of human relationships. A, B, C, and D are friends in the sense of friendship which Aristotle takes to be primary. That is, they share in the pursuit of certain goods. In my terms, they share in a practice. D dies in obscure circumstances. A discovers how D dies and he, how D died and tells the truth about it to B while lying to C. C discovers the lie. What A cannot then intelligibly claim is that he stands in the same relationship of friendship to both B and C. 
By telling the truth to one and lying to the other, he has partially defined a difference in the relationship. Of course, it is open to A to explain this difference in a number of ways. Perhaps he was trying to spare C pain, or perhaps he is simply cheating C. But some difference in the relationship now exists as a result of the lie. For their allegiance to each other in the pursuit of common goods has been put in question. Just as, so long as we share the standards and purposes characteristic of practices, we define our relationship to each other, whether we acknowledge it or not, by references to standards of truthfulness and trust, so we define them too by reference to standards of justice and courage. If, if, a, if A, a professor, gives B and C the grades that their papers deserve, but grades D because he is attracted to D's blue eyes or is repelled by D's dandruff, he has defined his relationship to D differently from his relationship to the other members of the class, whether he wishes it or not. Justice requires that we treat others in respect of merit or desert according to uniform and impersonal standards. To depart from the standards of justice in some particular instance defines our relationship with the relevant person as in some way special or distinctive. The case with courage is a little different. We hold courage to be a virtue because the care and concern for individuals, communities, and causes, which is so crucial to so much in practice, requires the existence of such a virtue. If someone says that he cares for some individual, community, or cause, but is unwilling to risk harm or danger to his or her, uh, uh, risk harm or danger on his, her, or its own behalf, he puts in question the genuineness of his care and concern. Courage, the capacity to risk harm or danger to oneself, has its role in human life because of this connection with care and concern. It is not to say that a man cannot genuinely care and also be a coward. It is in part to say that a man who genuinely cares and has not the capacity for risking harm or danger has to define himself, both himself and to others, as a coward. I take it then that from the standpoint of those types of relationship without which practices cannot be sustained, truthfulness, justice, and courage, and perhaps some others are genuine excellences, are virtues in the light of which we have to characterize ourselves and others, whatever our private moral standpoint or our society's particular codes may be. For this recognition that we cannot escape the definition of our relationships in terms of such goods is perfectly compatible with the acknowledgement that different societies have and have had different codes of truthfulness, justice, and courage. Lutheran priests brought up their children to believe that one ought to tell the truth to everybody at all times, whether the circumstances or consequences, sorry, whatever the circumstances or consequences, and Kant was one of their children. Traditional Bantu parents brought up their children not to tell the truth to unknown strangers since they believed that this could render the family vulnerable to witchcraft. In our culture, many of us have been brought up not to tell the truth to elderly grand aunts who invite us to admire their new hats. But each of these codes embodies an acknowledgement of the virtue of truthfulness. So it is also with varying codes of justice and of courage. Practices then might flourish in societies with very different codes. What they could not do is flourish in societies in which the virtues were not valued, although institutions and technical skills serving unified purposes might well continue to flourish. I shall have more to say about the contrast between institutions and technical skills mobilized for a unified end on the one hand and practices on the other in a moment. For the kind of cooperation the kind of recognition of authority and of achievement, the kind of respect for standards and the kind of risk-taking which are characteristically involved in practices demands, for example, fairness in judging oneself and others. The kind of fairness absent in my example of the professor, a ruthless truthfulness without which fairness cannot find application. The kind of truthfulness absent in my example of A, B, C, and D, and willingness to trust the judgments of those whose achievement in the practice give them an authority to judge which presupposes fairness and truthfulness in those judgments, and from time to time the taking of self-endangering and even achievement-endangering risks. It is no part of my thesis that great violinists cannot be vicious or great chess play players mean-spirited. 
where the virtues are required, the vices may also flourish. It is just that the vicious and mean-spirited necessarily rely on the virtues of others for the practices in which they engage to flourish and also deny themselves the experience of achieving those internal goods which may reward even not very good chess players and violinists. To situate the virtues any further within practices, it is necessary now to clarify a little further the nature of a practice by drawing two important contrasts. The discussion so far, I hope, makes it clear that a practice in the sense intended is never just a set of technical skills, even when directed towards some unified purpose, and even if the exercise of those skills can on occasion be valued or enjoyed for their own sake. What is distinctive in a practice is in part the way in which conceptions of the relevant goods and ends which the technical skills serve and every practice does require the exercise of technical skills, are transformed and enriched by these extensions of human powers and by that regard for its own internal goods, which are partially definitive of each particular practice or type of practice. Practices never have a goal or goals fixed for all time. Painting has no such goal, nor has physics, but the goals themselves are transmuted by the history of the activity. It therefore turns out not to be accidental that every practice has its own history and a history which is more and other than that of the improvement of the relevant technical skills. This historical dimension is crucial in relation to the virtues. To enter into a practice is to enter into a relationship not only with its contemporary practitioners, but also with those who have, pra also with those who have preceded us in the practice, particularly those whose achievements extended to extended the reach of the practice to its present point. It is thus the achievement and a fortiori the authority of a tradition which I then confront and, in, and from which I have to learn. And for this learning and the relationship to the past which it embodies, the virtues of justice, courage, and truthfulness are prerequisite in precisely the same way and for precisely the same reasons as they are in sustaining present relationships within practices. It is not only, of course, which sets of technical skills that practices ought to be contrasted. Practices must not be confused with institutions. Chess and physics and medicine are practices. Chess clubs, laboratories, universities, and hospitals are institutions. Institutions are characteristically and necessarily concerned with what I have called external goods. They are involved in acquiring money and other material goods. They are structured in terms of power and status, and they distribute money, power, and status as rewards. Nor could they do otherwise if they are to sustain not only themselves, but also the practices of which they are bearers. For no practices can survive for any length of time unsustained by institutions. Indeed, so intimate is the relationship of practices to institutions and consequently of the goods external to the goods internal to the practices in question that institutions and practices characteristically form a single causal order in which the ideals and the creativity of the practice are always vulnerable to the acquisitiveness of the institution in which the, co the cooperative care for common goods of the practice is always vulnerable to the competitiveness of the institution. In this context, the essential function of the virtues is clear. Without them, without justice, courage, and truthfulness, practices could not resist the corrupting power of institutions. Yet, if institutions do have corrupting power, the making and sustaining of forms of human community and therefore of institutions itself has all the characteristics of a practice and moreover of a practice which stands in a peculiarly close relationship to the exercise of the virtues in two important ways. The exercise of the virtues is itself apt to require a highly determinate attitude to social and political issues, and it is always within some particular community with its own specific institutional forms that we learn or fail to learn to exercise the virtues. There is, of course, a crucial difference between the way in which the relationship between moral character and political community is envisioned from the standpoint of liberal individualist modernity and the way in which that relationship was envisioned from the standpoint of the type of ancient and medieval tradition of the virtues which I have sketched. For liberal individualism, a community is simply an arena 
in which individuals each pursue their own self-chosen conception of the good life and political institutions exist to provide that degree of order which makes such self-determined activity possible. Government and law are or ought to be neutral between rival conceptions of the good life for man, and hence, although it is the task of government to promote law abidingness, it is on the liberal view no part of the legitimate function of government to inculcate any one moral outlook. By contrast, on the particular ancient and medieval view, which I have sketched, political community not only requires the exercise of the virtues for its own sustenance, but it is one of the tasks of, parent, of parental authority to make children grow up so as to be virtuous adults. The classical statement of this analogy is by Socrates in the Crito. It does not, of course, follow from an acceptance of the Socratic view of political community and political authority that we ought to assign to the modern state the moral function which Socrates assigned to the city and its laws. Indeed, the power of the liberal individualist standpoint partly derives from the evident fact that the modern state is indeed totally unfitted to act as moral educator of any community. But the history of how the modern state emerged is, of course, itself a moral history. If my account of the complex relationship of virtues to practices and to institutions is correct, it follows that we shall be unable to write a true history of practices and institutions unless that history is also one of the virtues and vices. For the ability of a practice to retain its integrity will depend on the way in which the virtues can be and are exercised in sustaining the institutional forms which are the social bearers of the practice. The integrity of a practice casually requires the exercise of the virtues by at least some of the individuals who embody it in their activities. And conversely, the corruption of institutions is always in part at least an effect of the vices. The virtues are, of course, themselves in turn fostered by, fostered by certain types of social institution and endangered by others. Thomas Jefferson thought that only in a society of small farmers could the virtues flourish. And Adam Ferguson, with a good deal more sophistication, saw the institutions of modern commercial society as engendering at least some traditional, as endangering at least some traditional virtues. It is Ferguson's type of sociology, which is the empirical counterpart of the conceptual account of the virtues which I have given, a sociology which aspires to lay bare the empirical causal connection between virtues, practices, and institutions. For this kind of conceptual account has strong empirical implications. It provides an explanatory scheme which can be tested in particular cases. Moreover, my thesis has empirical content in another way. It does entail that without the virtues there could be a recognition only of what I have called external goods and not at all of internal goods in the context of practices. And in any society which recognized only external goods, competitiveness would be the dominant and even exclusive feature. We have a brilliant portrait of such a society in Hobbes's account of the state of nature. And Professor Turnbull's report of the fate of the ick suggests that social reality does, in the most horrifying way, confirm both my thesis and Hobbes's. Virtues then stand in a different relationship to external and internal and to internal goods. The possession of the virtues, and not only of their semblance and simulacra, is necessary to achieve the latter, yet the possession of the virtues may perfectly well hinder us in achieving external goods. I need to emphasize at this point that external goods genuinely are goods. Not only are they characteristic objects of human desire, whose allocation is what gives point to the virtues of justice and generosity, but no one can despise them altogether without a certain hypocrisy. Yet notoriously, the cultivation of truthfulness, justice, and courage will often, the world being what it contingently is, bar us from being rich or famous or powerful. Thus, although we may hope that we can not only achieve the standards of excellence and the internal goods of certain practices by possessing the virtues and, and become rich, famous, and powerful, the virtues are always a potential stumbling block to this comfortable ambition. We should therefore expect that, if in a particular society the pursuit of external goods were to become dominant, the concept of the virtues might suffer first attrition and then perhaps something near total effacement, 
although simulacra might abound. The time has come to ask the question of how far this partial account of a core conception of the virtues and I need to emphasize that all that I have offered so far as the first stage of such an account is faithful to the tradition which I delineated. How far, for example, and in what ways is it Aristotelian? It is, happily, not Aristotelian in two ways in which a good deal of the rest of the tradition also dissents from Aristotle. First, although this account of the virtues is teleological, it does not require any allegiance to Aristotle's metaphysical biology. And secondly, just because of the multiplicity of human practices and the consequent multiplicity of goods in the pursuit of which the virtues may be exercised, goods which will often be contingently incompatible and which will therefore make rival claims upon our allegiance, conflict will not spring solely from flaws in individual character. But it was just on these two matters that Aristotle's account of the virtues seemed most vulnerable. Hence, if it turns out to be the case that this socially teleological account could support Aristotle's general account of the virtues as well as it does his own biologically teleological account, these differences from Aristotle himself may well be regarded as strengthening rather than weakening the case for a generally Aristotelian standpoint. There are at least three ways in which the account that I have given is clearly Aristotelian. First, it requires for its completion a cogent elaboration of just those distinctions and concepts which Aristotle's account requires, that is, voluntariness, the distinction between the intellectual virtues and the virtues of character, the relationship of both to natural abilities and to the passions and the structure of practical reasoning. On every one of these topics, something very like Aristotle's view has to be defended if my own account is to be plausible. Secondly, my account can, accom can accommodate an Aristotelian view of pleasure and enjoyment, whereas it is interestingly irreconcilable with any utilitarian view, and more particularly with Franklin's account of the virtues. We can approach these questions by considering how to reply to someone who, having considered my account of the differences between goods internal to and goods external to a practice, inquired into which class, if either, does pleasure or enjoyment fall. The answer is, some types of pleasure into one, some into the other. Someone who achieves excellence in a practice, who plays chess or football well, or who carries through an inquiry in physics or an experimental mode in painting with success, characteristically enjoys his achievement and his activity in achieving. So does someone who, although not breaking the limit of achievement, plays or thinks or acts in a way that leads towards such a breaking of limit. As Aristotle says, the enjoyment of the activity and the enjoyment of achievement are not the ends at which the agent aims, but the enjoyment supervenes upon the successful activity in such a way that the activity achieved and the activity enjoyed are one and the same state. Hence, to aim at the one is to aim at the other, and hence also it is easy to confuse the pursuit of excellence with the pursuit of enjoyment in this specific sense. This particular confusion is harmless enough. What is not harmless is the confusion of enjoyment in this specific sense with other forms of pleasure. For certain kinds of pleasure are, of course, external goods along with prestige, status, power, and money. Not all pleasure is the enjoyment supervening upon achieved activity. Some is the pleasure of psychological or physical states independent of all activity. Some states, for example, that produced on a normal palate by the closely successive and thereby blended sensations of the Colchester oyster, cayenne pepper, and Vevue cliquois may be sought as external goods, as external rewards which may be purchased by money or received in virtue of prestige. Hence, the pleasures are categorized neatly and appropriately by the classification into internal and external goods. It is just this classification which can find no place within Franklin's account of the virtues, which is framed entirely in terms of external relationships and external goods. Thus, although by this stage of the argument it is possible to claim that my account does capture a conception of the virtues which is at the core of the particular ancient and medieval tradition which I have delineated, it is equally clear that there is more than one possible conception of the virtues and that Franklin's standpoint, and indeed any utilitarian standpoint, is such that to accept it will entail rejecting the tradition and vice versa. One crucial point of incompatibility was noted long ago by D.H. Lawrence. 
when Franklin asserts, rarely use venery, but for health or offspring, Lawrence replies, never use venery. It is of the character of a virtue that in order that it be effective in producing the internal goods, which are the rewards of the virtues, it should be exercised without regard to consequences. For it turns out to be the case that, and this is part at least one more, this is part at least one more empirical factual claim. Although the virtues are just those qualities which tend to lead to the achievement of a certain class of goods, nonetheless, unless we practice them irrespective of whether any particular set of contingent circumstances, they will produce those goods or not, we cannot possess them at all. We cannot be genuinely courageous or truthful and be so only on occasion. Moreover, as we have seen, cultivation of the virtues always may and often does hinder the achievement of those external goods which are the mark of worldly success. The road to success in Philadelphia and the road to heaven may not coincide after all. Furthermore, we are now able to specify one crucial difficulty for any version of utilitarianism. In addition to those which I noticed earlier, utilitarianism cannot accommodate the distinction between goods internal to and goods external to practice. Not only is that distinction marked by none of the classical utilitarians, it cannot be found in Bentham's writings, nor in those of either the Mills or of Sedgwick, but internal goods and external goods are not commensurable with each other. Hence, the notion of summing goods and a fortiori, in light of what I have said about kinds of pleasure and enjoyment, the notion of summing happiness, in terms of one single formula or completion of utility, whether it is Franklin's or Bentham's or Mill's, makes no sense. Nonetheless, we ought to note that although this distinction is alien to J.S. Mill's thought, it is plausible and in no way patronizing to suppose that something like this is the distinction which he was trying to make in utilitarianism when he distinguished between higher and lower pleasures. At the most, we can say that something like this for J.S. Mill's upbringing had given him a limited view of human life and powers, had unfitted him, for example, for appreciating games just because of the way it had fitted him for appreciating philosophy. Nonetheless, the notion that the pursuit of excellence in a way that extends human powers is at the heart of human life is instantly recognizable as at home in not only J.S. Mill's political and social thought, but also in his and Mr. Taylor's life. Where were I to choose human exemplars of, the, of certain of the virtues as I understand them, there would of course be many names to name, those of St. Benedict, and St. Francis of Assisi, and St. Teresa, and those of Frederick Engels, and Eleanor Marx, and Lenin Trotsky among them. But that of John Stuart Mill would have to be there as certainly as any other. Thirdly, my account is Aristotelian in that it links evaluation and explanation in a characteristically Aristotelian way. From an Aristotelian standpoint, to identify certain actions in manifesting or failing to manifest a virtue or virtues is never only to evaluate. It is also to take the first step towards explaining why those actions rather than some others were performed. Hence, for an Aristotelian quite as much as for a Platonist, the fate of a city or an individual can be explained by citing the injustice of a tyrant or the courage of its defenders. Indeed, without allusion to the place that justice and injustice, courage and cowardice play in human life, very little will be genuinely explicable. explicable. It follows that many of the exemplary projects of the modern social sciences, a methodological canon of which is the separation of the facts, this conception of the facts is one which I de delineated in chapter 7, from all evaluation, are bound to fail. For the fact that someone was or failed to be courageous or just cannot be recognized as a fact by those who accept that methodological canon. The account of the virtues which I have given is completely at one with Aristotle's on this point. But now the question may be raised. Your account may be in many respects Aristotelian, but is, it, but, it is it, but is it not in some respects false? Consider the following important objection. 
I have defined the virtues partially in terms of their place and practices, but surely it may be suggested some practices, that is, some coherent human activities which answer to the description of what I have called a practice, are evil. So in discussions by some moral philosophers of this type of account of the virtues, it has been suggested that torture and sadomasochistic sexual activities might be examples of practices. But how can a disposition be a virtue if it is the kind of disposition which sustains practices and some practices issue in evil? My answer to this objection falls into two parts. First, I want to allow that there may be practices, in the sense in which I understand the concept, which simply are evil. I am far from convinced that there are, and I do not in fact believe that either torture or sadomastic sexuality answers to the description of a practice which my account of the virtues employs but I do not want to rest my case on this lack of conviction, especially since it is plain that as a matter of contingent fact, many types of practice may on particular occasions be productive of evil. For the range of practices includes the arts, the sciences, and certain types of intellectual and athletic game. And it is at once obvious that any of these may under certain conditions be a source of evil. The desire to excel and to win can corrupt, a man may be so engrossed by his painting that he neglects his family. What was initially an honorable resort to war can issue in savage cruelty. But what follows from this? It certainly is not the case that my account entails either that we ought to excuse or condone such evils or that whatever flows from a virtue is right. I do have to allow that courage sometimes sustains injustice, that loyalty has been known to strengthen, to strengthen a murderous aggressor, and that generosity has sometimes weakened the capacity to do good. But to deny this would be to fly in the face of just those empirical facts which I invoked in criticizing Aquinas' account of the unity of the virtues. That the virtues need initially to be defined and explained with reference to the notion of a practice thus in no way entails approval of all practices in all circumstances. That the virtues, as the objection itself presupposed, are defined not in terms of good and right practices, but of practices, does not entail or imply that practices as actually carried through at particular times and places do not stand in need of moral criticism and the resources for such criticism are not lacking. There is, in the first place, no inconsistency appealing to, in appealing to the requirements of a virtue to criticize a practice. Justice may be initially defined as a disposition which is, in its particular way, necessary to sustain practices. It does not follow that in pursuing the requirements of a practice, violations of justice are not to be condemned. Moreover, I already pointed out in chapter 12 that a morality of virtues requires as its counterpart a conception of moral law. Its requirements, too, have to be met by practices. But it may be asked, does not all this imply that more needs to be said about the place of practices in some moral context? Does not this at least suggest that there is more to the core concept of a virtue than could be spelled out in terms of practices? I have, after all, emphasized that the scope of any virtue in human society extends beyond the practices in terms of which it is initially defined. What, then, is the place of the virtues in the larger arenas of human life? I stressed earlier that, in, that any account of the virtues in terms of practices could only be a partial and first account. What is required to complement it? The most notable difference so far between my account and any account that be, could be called Aristotelian is that although I have no way that I have in no way restricted the exercise of the virtues to the context of practices, it is in terms of practices that I have located their point and function. Whereas Aristotle locates that point and function in terms of the notion of a type of whole human life which can be called good, and it does seem that the question, what would a human being lack who lacked the virtues, must be given a kind of answer which goes beyond anything which I have said so far. For such an individual would not merely fail in a variety of particular ways in respect of the kind of excellence which can be achieved through participation in practices and respect in the, of the kind of a human relationship required to sustain such excellence. His own life viewed as a whole would perhaps be defective. It would not be the kind of life 
which someone would describe in trying to answer the question, what is the best kind of life for this kind of man or woman to live? And that question cannot be answered without at least raising Aristotle's own question. What is the good of life for man? What is the good life for man? Consider three ways in which human life informed only by the conception of the virtues sketched so far would be defective. It would be pervaded, first of all, by too many conflicts and too much arbitrariness. I argued earlier that, is it a, that it is a merit of an account of the virtues in terms of, of a multiplicity of goods that it allows for the possibility of tragic conflict in a way in which Aristotle does not. But it may also produce, even in the life of someone who is virtuous and disciplined, too many occasions when one allegiance points in one direction, another in another. The claims of one practice may be incompatible with another in such a way that one may find oneself oscillating in an arbitrary way rather than making rational choices. So it seems to have been with T.E. Lawrence. Commitment to sustaining the kind of community in which the virtues can flourish may be incompatible with the devotion which a particular practice of the arts, for example, requires. So there may be tensions between the claims of family life and those of the arts, the problem that Gao Guin solved or failed to solve by fleeing to Polynesia, or between the claims of politics and those of the arts, the problem that Le Lenin solved or failed to solve by refusing to listen to Beethoven. If the life of the virtues is continuously fractured by choices in which one allegiance entails apparently arbitrary renunciation of another, it may seem that the goods internal to practices do, after all, derive their authority from our individual choices. For when different goods summon in different and in incompatible directions, I have to choose between their rival claims. The modern self with its criterionless choices, apparently reappears in the alien context of what was claimed to be an Aristotelian world. This accusation might be rebutted in part by recurring to the question of why both goods and virtues do have authority in our lives and repeating what was said earlier in this chapter. But this reply would only be partly successful. The distinctively modern notion of choice would indeed have reappeared, even if with a more limited scope for its exercise than it has usually claimed. Secondly, without an overriding conception of the telos of a whole human life, conceived as a unity, our conception of certain individual virtues has to remain partial and complete. Consider two examples. Justice, on an Aristotelian view, is defined in terms of giving each person his or her due or desert. To deserve well is to have contributed in some substantial way to the achievement of those goods, the sharing of which and the common pursuit of which provide foundations for human community. But the goods internal to practices, including the goods internal to the practice of making and sustaining forms of community, need to be ordered and evaluated in some way if we are to assess relative desert. Thus, any substantive application of an Aristotelian concept of justice requires an understanding of goods and of the good that goes beyond the multiplicity of goods which inform practices. As with justice, so, as, so also with patience. Pat patience is the virtue of waiting attentively without complaint, but not of waiting thus for anything at all. To treat patience as a virtue presupposes some adequate answer to the question, waiting for what? Within the context of, a pract of practices, a partial, although for many purposes, adequate answer can be given. The patience of a craftsman with refractory material, of a teacher with a slow pupil, of a politician in negotiations, are all species of patience. But what if the material is just too refractory, the pupil too slow, the negotiations too frustrating? Ought we always, at a certain point, just to give up in the interests of the practice itself? The medieval exponents of the virtue of patience claimed that there are certain types of situation in which the virtue of patience requires that I do not ever give up on some person or tasks. Situations in which, as they would have put it, I am required to embody in my attitude to that person or task something of the patient attitude of God towards his creation. But this could only be so if patience served some overriding good, some telos which warranted putting other goods in a subordinate place. 
thus it turns out that the content of the virtue of patience depends upon how we order various goods in a hierarchy and a fortiori on whether we are able rationally so to order these particular goods i have suggested so far that unless there is a telos which transcends the limited goods of practices by constituting the good of a whole human life the good of a human life conceived as a unity it will both be the case that a certain subversive arbitrariness will invade the moral life and that we shall be unable to specify the content of the context of certain virtues adequately these two considerations are reinforced by a third that there is at least one virtue recognized by the tradition which cannot be specified at all except with reference to the wholeness of a human life the virtue of integrity or constancy purity of heart said kierkegaard is to will one thing this notion of singleness of purpose in a whole life can have no application unless that of a whole life does it is clear therefore that my preliminary account of the virtues in terms of practices captures much but very far from all of what the aristotelian tradition taught about the virtues it is also clear that to give an account that is at once more fully adequate to that tradition and rationally defensible it is necessary to raise a question to which the aristotelian pre tradition presupposed an answer an answer so widely shared in the pre-modern world that it never had to be formally ex formally ex formulated explicitly in any detailed way that this question is the following is it rationally justifiable to conceive of each human life as a unity so that we may try to specify each such life as having its good and so that we may understand the virtues as having their function in enabling an individual to make of his or her life one kind of unity rather than another.